Today is all about responsive web design. If you want your websites to be successful, you have to make it look good on every device. But the problem is, responsive web design is not one concept you need to learn. There's Flexbox, Grid, Media Queries, and even if you learned all of that, that still might not be enough. So this video is going to be different. I'm going to show you five extremely important responsive techniques that interestingly have nothing to do with Flexbox or Grid, but they are going to make all the difference in how you approach coding in CSS. Tip number one, relative padding. The problem with padding is that you often need to specify two different paddings. The padding that fits on your desktop screen is way too big for a mobile screen. You see, this container here has a padding of 5EM, which works well for my desktop screen. But as you can see on a mobile screen, that is a bit too much. Many people would solve this with a media query. So you have one padding for your desktop, and then at a certain breakpoint, you change it to something else, which is totally fine. But here's a much cooler way. Instead of providing only one value for our padding, we apply two different values a fixed value for desktop devices, and a responsive unit for all the other sizes. You can do this using the min function in CSS. The min function can receive multiple arguments. You provide CSS values with different units, and the function will calculate which of these values is the smallest one, and apply that to the padding property. So here's how it works. We can apply a padding of 5EM, for example, which is a fixed unit. Then with a comma, we provide a second value, for example, 8%. This is now a relative unit. Now this function will calculate which of these values is smaller. On a desktop screen, which is pretty wide, 5pm is going to be smaller than 8% of the parent element. In this case, the parent element is the body, so it's 8% of the screen. But if I resize the window, then we can see that on a smaller device, there's a point where 8% of the screen is going to be smaller than 5pm. So the min function switches and chooses 8% for the padding. And since 8% is a relative unit, it will get smaller and smaller as the screen gets smaller. So this way, we have a padding that looks great on a desktop screen and a mobile screen using only one declaration without a media query. Tip number two, responsive font sizes. Font sizes should be treated very carefully. Unfortunately, none of the CSS units we use for font sizes are responsive on their own. So we have to come up with a modern CSS solution for it. First recommendation is don't use pixels and use rem instead. Rem is a relative unit that scales relative to the root font size, which is usually 16 pixels per default. For example, if you apply a font size of 1.5 rem, that is 16 pixels times 1.5, which equals 24 pixels. But what do we do with big headings on small screens, especially when we want to avoid line breaks that would take tons of media queries for all the different screen sizes where you have to apply a different font size to make it look good. Here's an idea to approach this, but be careful. You can use the viewport unit viewport width. For example, 10 VW scales the font size to 10% of the viewport width. This works great for scaling headings relative to the screen size. I chose 10VW because it works great for this heading, but you will need to adjust this for your own heading. As you can see, when I resize the window, the heading will scale relative to the width of the screen. It will always fit perfectly without a line break. However, there are three things you need to consider. First of all, big screens. On an ultra wide monitor, like my 34 inch display, this heading will be way too big because 10% of an ultra wide monitor is still a lot. So we need a maximum size. The second thing is small screens. On a smartphone screen, this heading can get way too small because 10% of a smartphone screen is really, really small. And remember, this should be a heading. So it definitely should be bigger than the rest of the text. So we also need a minimum size. The best solution here is to use the clamp function. With clamp, you can provide three values, a minimum value, a preferred value, and a maximum value. So now the clamp function will always use 10 viewport width as long as our minimum or maximum value is not reached. This ensures that our heading works great on every screen because it cannot be bigger than 5 rem, but it also can't be smaller than 1.8 rem. So in that case, it will create a line break if it gets too small, but I think that's fine. But there's still one more problem. When clamp chooses to use 10 VW for the font size, then this size does not zoom with the rest of the page. So if we zoom in and out using the control mouse wheel, we won't see any changes. The rest of the page can zoom, but not this heading, because this unit, VW, is based only on the viewport and nothing else. Other units like rem or pixels, for example, they can be zoomed in. So to fix this, we have to combine VW with a zoomable unit like rem, for example. For that, I use the calc function in CSS. I calculate 7VW plus 1 rem. This way, the font size scales with the viewport and also responds to user zooming. It's the best of both worlds. But you will have to figure this out for your own heading. Tip number three, responsive images. 
By default, HTML images are not responsive. If I resize the browser window, you will see that they leave the screen. And here you might want to use the max width property and set this to 100% so that the image can never be bigger than 100% of the screen size. But you will see this will cause the image to stretch or distort. That is because of the height and width attribute in HTML. For SEO reasons, it is recommended to define the height and width in HTML. You do this to reserve space for the image and reduce cumulative layout shifts, CLS. CLS is when your image content shifts around as the image or other resources load. So since you need this in HTML, you have to make the image responsive in CSS. First, you still need the max width of 100%, but you will also need height auto. This way the image will resize on smaller devices. But what if you have to handle multiple images and they all have different dimensions? In these cases, it's often better to maintain a consistent design by forcing the images to have the same dimensions. For that, I use the aspect ratio property. For example, an aspect ratio of 1 by 1 is used to have a square. Use the aspect ratio of 16 by 9 for a smartphone in landscape mode. And vice versa, you can use the aspect ratio 9 by 16 for a smartphone in portrait. But the moment you change the aspect ratio property, the image will look stretched. This is a weird default setting in CSS. When that happens, you have to use the object fit property. Object fit contain ensures that the entire image fits within the aspect ratio, but it might leave empty spaces. I can show you this by applying a red background. So the red area is the aspect ratio we actually want the image to have. But if we use object fit contain, then we want to contain the entire image. So we end up with these empty spaces. But if we use object fit cover, we get a different result. Here it tries to cover the entire aspect ratio. So there are no empty spaces. But obviously to achieve this effect, it will automatically zoom in a bit and therefore cut off parts of the image. But still, I think this is a great solution to have consistent image dimensions. Now let's move on to tip number four, which will solve a very common problem that I see on so many different websites. This tip is about the viewport height unit, because this unit is sort of problematic. We can use a height of 100 viewport height to make an element span the entire height of the viewport. That means it will cover the entire screen, especially if we have no margin and padding interfering and we only use box sizing border box, then we can see how this will perfectly cover the size of the screen. I'm using a thick blue border to show you exactly where the element is. But here's the thing, while this works great on a desktop screen, on a smartphone screen, you will see a problem. Here our element is slightly bigger than one screen size, even though I specified 100 viewport height. And this is not good because I have to scroll down. And by the way, you can only see this problem when you test it on a real smartphone. In the browser's developer tools, it will look fine. This problem happens because mobile browsers reserve space for UI elements like the address bar. And this is not accounted for in the 100 viewport height, which is why we have to scroll down. To fix this exact problem, CSS introduced a newer version of the viewport height unit. It is called DVH. If you use this unit, then it will work properly on smartphone screens. As you can see, the blue border is positioned perfectly at the bottom. And if you're worried about browser compatibility, you can always just write both ways of doing it, and the browser will just ignore the one that doesn't work. Tip number five. This one is technically an HTML tip. When creating responsive designs, we often hide large surface areas like navbars or dropdown areas on smaller screens. We often put them inside a hamburger menu. To toggle these menus with transitions, you cannot use display none, since this doesn't allow transitions. While using display none is totally fine, many developers like to go a different path to make the transition work. So instead, you might want to use the opacity property to fade in and out the element, or use position absolute and other properties to move the element off screen because these properties will work with a nice transition. While these techniques work, they are not accessible because hidden elements are still tabbable and remain in the accessibility tree. So what is the solution? You can use the inert attribute in HTML. The inert attribute removes the element from the accessibility tree, ensuring that the user cannot accidentally interact with the element. In your JavaScript logic, make sure to add or remove the inert attribute whenever you hide or show the element. This is a more advanced technique, and making a fully responsive and accessible hamburger menu requires additional logic, which is why we dedicated an entire video to it. So if you want to learn more about this, then watch this video right here. There I explain how to build a fully responsive and accessible navbar step by step. My name is Fabian, and this was Coding2Go. I will see you in the next video.